A few snapshots of the former Rancho La Puente and the surrounding areas in the late 1950s to the late 1960s. Ten years of growth and expansion that laid the foundation for the current communities we know today. Some of that time's first neighborhoods, first churches, first schools, and first businesses were built in that time frame. And along with the essentials for a growing community was a need for entertainment, musical or otherwise, a distraction from the daily grind, places to let off steam and let go. Hi, I'm Marty Shields, and I'm standing here in the city of industry in front of a house that hasn't always been just a house. For some 35 years, it was the home of radio station KGRB 900 AM on your radio dial, playing big band and swing music since 1957 broadcasting to the valley and the surrounding areas on 500 watts. Its signal here on the corner of Glen Hope and Echelon was just one of the ways residents here in the valley found their entertainment years ago. Today we'll look back at a time when the area's citizens enjoyed the entertainment and freedom of their own nightclubs, lounges, honky-tonks and bars. Join us as we dial into Music in the Valley here on another edition of Forgotten Tales. At the beginning of the 20th century, residents of the valley had a limited opportunity to enjoy socializing and dancing regularly at halls, bars, and clubs when they wanted to. Most of the big socials were held by private groups, clubs, and organizations at those sites, in venues they owned. It was, for the most part, a pretentious side of our society. First, let's go way back to one of the earliest privately owned dance halls in the area. It was 1902 when members of the Independent Order of Oddfellows of Whittier built a second story on a building in downtown Whittier for both secret rituals and ceremonies and large dances. And after 1933, the building on Comstock in Philadelphia has seen many owners. But the second story is still considered one of the first known dance halls in the outlying areas of the rancho. Some venues sprang up by chance, others were reluctant, and some were by an act of God. In 1929, Elmonte High School constructed a large gymnasium on campus. It would eventually be used as a training site for the 1932 Los Angeles Olympic Games. In the name of the President of the United States, I proclaim open the Olympic Games of Los Angeles celebrating the 10th Olympiad. One year later, Elmonte High School was devastated by the 1933 Long Beach earthquake. It was finally rebuilt, but some two miles away, leaving the giant gymnasium vacant and alone. The gym was eventually purchased by the local American Legion in 1944. It was renamed Elmonte Legion Stadium. And by the late 1940s, the stadium began to turn into a flashpoint for some of the first large desegregated dance concerts. And TV shows were broadcast from there late into the 1950s. Elsewhere in the valley, longtime residents, who at one time had been sheep herders, wanted a club of their own. In La Puente in 1947, Basque residents began to construct a hall for both gatherings and dances. The seclusion of halls, lounges, bars, and auditoriums created a social barrier for the area's residents. It fired a need to find a place of their own for any and all, to meet, socialize, dance, and most importantly, connect on a regular basis. All that would change in 1959, with an influx of nightclubs, lounges, honky-tonk western bars, and large dance halls began to pop up everywhere in the valley. The Kona Cove, the Pace Center, the Disco Teen Club, the Hobnob, the Golden Penny, the Bandbox, Nashville West, the Hilltop Club, the Cave, Mr. Lee's Swingin' Affair, the Posh, the Odyssey, the Water Wheel, the 49er Club, the Garage, Buzzies, the Copa Club, and on and on. In 
the city of industry, it was the Silver Dollar and the notorious Country Western Club, the Aces. Built in the early 60s, the Stone Face Club on Valley Boulevard was best known for its big name performers, a big dance floor, and a big reputation as a tough club. For both locals and patrons from as far away as Riverside, this popular destination was known for its parking lot fights. In the late 60s, musician and once member of the rock band The Birds, Graham Parsons, was hanging around the Aces Club late night jam sessions looking for musicians for a band he was forming. And on one occasion, the Malvy long haired folky got rolled in the parking lot, never to return. The house band at the Aces was led by Eddie Drake, a local celebrity from his TV appearances on Cal's Corral and a DJ. Radio station KWOW. KWOW 1600. Broadcast out of a small cinder block building on a reservoir drive in Pomona. Because of Eddie's affiliation with the radio station, KWOW often promoted the Aces Club's upcoming shows. When artists like Loretta Lynn. Charlie Pride came through town to perform with the Aces. Eddie and his band backed them up. Six minutes to the west in downtown La Pointe on First Street was the Aces Club's chief competition, the Blue Room. The smaller venue built in 1957 this honky-tonk bar prided itself in keeping up with its highbrow neighbor, the Aces. Not to be outdone, the owner of the Blue Room had radio station KIEV 870 AM promote the club's upcoming shows and late-night jam sessions. Some of the rivalry between the two clubs stemmed from the jump of Eddie Drake and his house band from the Blue Room to the Aces Club in 1964. And for a short time, between 1965 and 1969, the Blue Room and the Aces Club were considered the best one-two punch in local honky-tonk clubs. During the same period on the FM radio dial, stations were promoting music that was as different as Bill Monroe. The people would come from far away, the day so light till the break of day. When they called her a holler, Josie Doe, you knew Uncle Finn was ready to go. Was to MC5. Hey. KHJ Boss Radio 93 FM brought the sound of rock and roll along with radio stations like KRLA and KFWB to its young listeners. Focused on a younger audience than the country radio stations, it too had a rougher, more aggressive and intense music and bands to promote. In January of 1968, a dark blues jazz influenced quartet from Venice, California were in West Covina for a two night gig at the Fabulous Carousel Theater. Former employee Bob Freitas remembers the theater from where the carousel once stood. Uh, basically, it was the theater, which is, it would have been sitting right where we're, I'm sitting right now. The well, Holiday Inn, which is right over here, was built specifically for the theater. Uh, other than that, between the Holiday Inn and the theater was a massive parking lot. On the opposite side, where Marie Callender's is right now, was a parking lot. And Charlie Brown's further down existed uh, at the time. The building is still there. That was pretty much it. Across the freeway, a lot has changed. Of course, a lot of the taller buildings here weren't here at the time. But that was pretty much for this particular area right here. West Covina's Carousel Theater was the premier live performance theater in the valley. Overall, it was fairly large. Uh, when you look at photographs of it, it doesn't really look that big. Uh, it would be bigger than the, the building behind me. Uh, it incorporated, of course, the, the main lobby, uh, the concourse, the seating, the stage, four snack bars. Uh, you had a backstage area, which was a copy of the, the main stage for rehearsals. 
Uh, you had an orchestra room, which I forgot about. Uh, all the dressing rooms, prop rooms. Uh, it was a lot bigger than you'd really think it would be. Its seating capacity was 3,300. Its stage was in the round. The venue was known for its plays, musicals, celebrity showcases, and by 1967, its rock and roll concerts. I did a couple of concerts, uh, Mamas and Papas and the Young Rascals, and being a teenager at that time, in person, the Young Rascals were not young. We were very shocked at that. <laughs> but Mamas and Papas were really nice. I had uh, the privilege of taking care of Mama Cass's parents in the dressing room uh, backstage. Uh, very nice people. She herself was very nice. She came in just briefly. Uh, but yeah, it just it was a great experience. I loved it. January 19th and 20th in 1968. Were you there? The theater hosted a rock band. The Doors. The first night Jim Morrison was both showman and shaman. The audience getting its money's worth. Second night, not so much. Whether his pending court date was on his mind, or possibly an intake of substances, the Lizard King was off, stumbling and plowing through the performance. On that same evening, 15 miles away across the Pointy Hills, Whittier High School's auditorium was the location for both the first concert of the year and a mystery that would last 40 years. Unlike the darker, more dangerous show going on at West Covina that same night, Whittier High would be the host to the folk rock band Buffalo Springfield. Also attending that night's concert was Rio Hondo College student, Whittier resident and amateur photographer, Don Kilson. And I think I had, looking back at these photos, I must have had access to the pit and backstage. Well, not backstage, because I have nothing in the Springfield other than on stage during their performance. The decades-old mystery began with the opening band at the concert that night consisted of five local students from Lucerna High and Whittier. Originally known as the Weeds, their band was popular in Whittier and played everywhere. Bob Waller, Tim Wardner, Rick Hunky, Mike Peters, and Bill Brumbeck, now known as the Hard Candy. Rick Hunky recalls his feelings that night in 1968. I, I know we were very nervous. Uh, it, was a, it was a big event for us. I do remember meeting some of the band members, the Springfield members, and they were all, you know, nice as could be, but it was, it was kind of a junior act. I was backstage or downstairs, and I was putting on this goofy suit, and I was half pulling up my pants there, and uh, Neil Young walked in with his girlfriend or his, you know, a bunch of roadies or something like that. Just, oh, Jesus. <laughs> and that was about it. That night, the show's lineup included the host of TV's Groovy Show, Michael Blagette, and seeing her next name on stage, the concert's promoter and manager of the hard candy, Dirk Dirksen. Dirk Dirksen was a Hollywood insider who had hosted the once popular TV talent show contest, Rocket to Stardom. Um, he picked up the band to manage us. I think he was mainly interested in quality as well, had the star quality, and the rest of the band really was interested in. Bob Waller. Bob Waller was the charismatic frontman and lead singer for the Hard Candy. Waller's stage presence and good looks were vital to the band's success to date. Bob was the lead singer, so he was kind of the front guy. Um, he, did a, uh, he did a good Mick Jagger. Yeah, yeah a real good looking guy. And, you, know, it's, it's, you want to have a nice looking pretty boy out in front of the stage and stuff like that. 
Once Dirksen began managing the group, Bob began to perform a solo spot at the shows. Interestingly enough, the rocker had a knack for writing folk songs and really dug Donovan. Blue is the color of the sky in the morning when we rise in the morning when we rise and along with opening up for Buffalo Springfield hard candy guitarist Tim Wardner had the foresight to bring his Sony TC 200 stereo tape recorder to the concert to record the performance of Buffalo Springfield and thus begin the mystery Rick Hunky remembers setting up the recorder with Tim yeah I set it up right here I helped him set it up um, yeah, we just put out, it was Sony Reels are Real, we put it in the middle of the stage and had mics running out stage left, stage right, and um, turned it on, nobody seemed to you know, care. Shortly after the concert, Hard Candy broke up. Bob Waller moved to Hollywood under the guidance of Dirk Dirksen. The remaining members of the Hard Candy played together now and then, but never as Hard Candy. Don Kelson put the photos he had taken that night in a shoebox and stored them away and left for Vietnam. Memories of that night in January of 1968 faded. Sometime in the late 70s, a bootleg album entitled Stampede was making the rounds. It claimed to have live recorded songs from Buffalo Springfield at Whittier High School in the late 60s. Singing songs at the carry inside. Mostly say you lay for us. What made the recording so unique was that only a few live performances existed of Springfield, and the ones that did were of bad quality. The question was, was this from January 20th in Whittier? The original tape having been stolen out of Tim Wardner's car in New York City in the early 70s. In 2003, a small debate was brewing online about the authenticity of the Whittier recordings. Some rock aficionados felt the recording was from either the Fillmore West or the Teen 20 Club in Long Beach in 1967. No one had yet stepped forward to confirm the tape as being legit and from January 20th of 1968. Yeah, well I kind of looked into it. I mean. <clears throat> A few years ago, I started hearing rumors about the tapes are good online. Then, in 2009, former Buffalo Springfield drummer Dewey Martin passes away. Dewey Martin died. I'd gotten a call from a colleague uh, where I work. I work at the Los Angeles Times, and he said, Dewey Martin has died, and I know you have a picture of him performing with uh, the Springfield. And can, we, can you get it? I mean, we just know now and we have a deadline in an hour, so. I had to call my wife who uh, dug through my uh, library and found the image and was able to uh, email it to me. The one that uh, is, is located or can be found on the internet. Springfield fan Bruce Harvey contacts Don Kelson after seeing this photograph. Yeah, Bruce Harvey came out of the woodwork and just said that, wow, I didn't know there was any photos, and we have a recording of that night. Some uh, some band member they take a reel to reel and put it on the floor and, and recorded that night's uh, music, and that's the first time that anybody knew there was photos from the outside, outside of my life, little sir. Former Hard Candy band members get wind of the photos and the decades-old controversy surrounding the recording that night. But guitarist Rick Hunky remembered hearing the original copy with members of Buffalo Springfield talking to the audience in between songs that night. Yeah, there's a lot of, between songs there's a lot of banter with mostly the girls from the audience. They're screaming out, 
requests for songs. Um, and one of the requests was for, uh, I think this time is uh, Every Day, Every Days, on the first album, which is a piano song that Steve Stills did. And he goes, uh, he says, well, I can't do it. I don't have a piano on stage. I spent all my money on my new Marshall amp and my that way. It proved the recording online was the Whittier tape from that night. 47 years later, the night Buffalo Springfield played at Whittier High is remembered. But yeah, I mean, the night was definitely, I mean, as I said, we were huge. And I still think the Buffalo Springfield is probably the best band, um, the best LA band uh, of the time. I mean, they were, they were very influential. They, you know, super talented people, and we were big fans of music. I mean, I'd never really heard anything like the Buffalo Springfield. I mean, there were other, you know, the Doors we liked, and you know, sure. some of the other local bands. But, um, yeah, I mean, the Springfield were really special and very influential. There'd be no Eagles, there'd be no, you know, Crosby, Stills, Nash, obviously. You know, you know, that whole strain of kind of LA country rock came on that one group. On a side note, we'd like to give recognition to a local composer and musician who really wasn't involved in the local music scene in the 60s, but he was a resident of Hacienda Heights and we felt we should give him a nod. Former state senator and ultra-conservative politician, Jack Tenney. In 1921, this dance hall pianist performed at one of the toughest border town dance halls in Mexicali, Mexico, the Owl Cafe and Dance Hall. In less than two years, Tenney, while dodging chairs and bottles, composed the popular Spanish waltz, Mexicali Rose. Although recorded by many artists, it was Bing Crosby's 1938 version that made it to the top of the hit parade. Goodbye. And that's the fact, Jack. I'll leave the front door open in case that you return. And lastly, we come to you from the last live performance venue that began in the 1960s and still operating today. While the old nightclubs are gone, they've changed owners and names, but the Sunset Room still remains here in Hacienda Heights. The audience is now prefer DJs with program playlists and spinning mirror balls and flashing disco lights. Some even feel that the human element, the connection between the performer and the audience and the dancer is being lost. And oh, by the way, the Sunset Room still has live performances, occasionally. Some things don't change, thank goodness. Join us as we invite you to take another look back in time with us on another edition of Forgotten Tales of the Rancho La Puente. Cheers and
Getting to the bottom of a story or myth can be an adventure in itself. If you have a mystery you would like to solve, I suggest you find out for yourself. Discover the information you're looking for at your local library today.